And uh, as well that you know, we've been going through Wednesday nights on looking at disciple, being a true disciple of Christ and coming. I wanted to come a little bit uh, forward in it by way of uh, Hebrews 11, verse number five. Let's go there. And I just want to read a verse that he makes note of here. As you know, Hebrews 11 is that great hall of fame of faith, if you will. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, but was not found because God had translated him. For before this, his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Uh, tonight, just uh, coming along the lines of being a disciple is having a good testimony. And um, we think about having a good testimony. Sometimes if you're not careful, as I am, you can do little things, even maybe big things that would ruin a testimony. And sometimes it's hard to get back, isn't it? What you have built in a lifetime can be ruined in a matter of minutes, and we know that. But thinking about this, I was reading through, and um, Enoch, very interesting character. But it says he had this testimony. He pleased God. Now, tonight I ask you again the question, do you have a good testimony? Do you live with that in view and that in the forefront of your mind? We think about here, Enoch was quite an individual. His record is given, as you know, in Genesis 5, verse 18 and forward. It says, And Jared lived 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Enoch lived 60 and five years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 360 and five, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for he took him. And we see here this man of God walked with God, pleased God, and God took him. God, uh, as the Bible says, translated him. Now, we know through Scripture that he was the seventh from Adam. Seven is always a special number in Scripture, you know. And uh, number uh, of completion, we know that. Number of rest, you could have put several things there. It appears he lived 65, to be 65, before he began his walk with the Lord. Uh, this began when his son Methuselah was born. His name is a prophecy, you know that, meaning when he is gone, it will come. It is obvious that God made him aware that judgment was coming because of the ungodliness that was becoming more and more transparent to them. Let me just say again, if the more time you spend in Scripture, the closer you get to God, the more you will be let known or the Lord will let you know in on more things. And not that He's going to speak to you audibly or anything like that, but you're going to have a knowledge and a wisdom about you. That's clear all throughout the Old Testament, right? especially Psalms and Proverbs. And as you think about it, uh, Enoch was a man that God could use and could trust because he had a good testimony. And his testimony was the emphasis of it was that he pleased God. And that ought to be ours, obviously, you know. Now, we know Jude also tells us that he was a prophet. Jude 1, verse 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, or of these, excuse me, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him so he was obviously a prophet he was obviously a preacher now we think about that we know other preachers throughout the old testament we know noah was a preacher he's a preacher of righteousness peter says right we know moses obviously was a preacher these men preached the word of god to those around them and encouraged others you know that and we see, now because he walked with God, he had a tremendous insight into what was going on around him. As I just said, you'll have a tremendous insight upon what's going on around you, right? I've said it before, but when you are in the Word of God, you develop what's called discernment. <laughs> discernment about the Word, discernment about the will of God, discernment, discernment about the work of God in your life. You don't throw your hands up and say, oh God, why does this happen to me again? Good night, can I catch a break here? No, you go, Lord, I don't understand it, but I know you're at work. Why? Because I have discernment that comes from the Word, Hebrews 4.12. Now, we see here he has a tremendous insight into what was going on around him. He knew what was coming. He knew what would take place. And we see throughout Scripture those individuals that had that insight were close to God, to the Word of God. Now, he had this testimony. His testimony was simple yet profound. Notice that. Some people say, well, what's your testimony? Keep your testimony. That could be a long, drawn-out thing. But for him, it was very simple. He pleased God. He pleased God. Underline that in your Bibles and 
memorized that especially, that he pleased God. Now we know Jesus Christ had the same testimony. It says, as Jesus spoke to those around him, he said, I do always those things that please the Father. I don't please self, right? Kids, you ought to be pleasing mom and dad, right? You ought to be looking for that. Can I, how, what can I do to help mom, dad? And don't do it so they can pat you on the back and say, well, thank you so much. No, you do it because why? It's the thing to do. God's commended it. And again, as we go up in authority, you know that we're pleasing God. We're pleasing who he's put into our lives. The word translated testimony means to be a witness, a test, to testify, both literally and figuratively, to bear record, to have a good, honest report, well reported up. So as we think about our testimony tonight, as being a disciple of Christ, are you a disciple tonight? I know you are. Are you a disciple? Have you crucified flesh? Have you taken up your cross? Have you followed him? And not this fluffy stuff that we have today, but have you crucified? I just heard recently a testimony of one of the most popular Christian singers today. Beautiful voice. Very popular. But they asked her directly, what do you believe, or what do you believe about Christ, in essence, really? What do you believe about Jesus? She couldn't, she fumbled out a few words, couldn't explain anything. Well, I, I don't, I, I, uh, he, uh, you know. That's not a Christian testimony. That's not somebody we would look to, to have our kids listen to. Good night. And I think about that. That's so much of today, just the fluffiness, so much of that stuff. Nothing there of solid, nothing there to grasp, to be rooted and grounded. They don't know what they believe. And we ought to be thinking about that. Do we have a good testimony tonight? You know the old Ch Chinese proverb. It says your talk talks, your walk talks, but your talk, walk talks louder than your talk talks. And when a person is you think about mention in Scripture, there's always something that comes to mind. You think about Jezebel. I say the name Jezebel. Uh, I, we saw one time a lady was picking it. It was on the news. She picked a name for her daughter Jezebel. You know, she had no idea what it meant. You know, and everyone's going, no, no. You know, there's a testimony involved connected to her. You think about it. You know, Judas Iscariot. You think, wow. Immediately you think of a testimony. Moses, Lot. Paul, Hitler, uh, you go down the line. People, you think of a testimony. What kind of testimony do we have? Now, first of all, good testimony. Notice is very important, obviously. Because we're showing people what Jesus Christ is like. The average person today will not and does not have any desire to pick up the Bible and read it. But they do look at you and look at me, don't they, and say, what do you believe? The, they read you, obviously, more than they do the Word of God. And we are showing people what Jesus Christ is like. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, your lifestyle, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And you think about it. By your good works, by your lifestyle, by what you do, by what you say, by where you go, all of that, right? We know obviously showing people what Jesus Christ is like. Who is he? Well, let me show you. Let me show you. Because we are influencing other believers. Now, again, you got to go through your Bibles, and I ought to go through my Bible as well, and look at the characteristics of Jesus Christ. It's not difficult, hard to figure out. He was a man, we know one, but he also was God manifested in the flesh. He had certain characteristics. He did things, as he said himself, leaving us an example not over our heads or our abilities, but things we can do, things we can follow. We're influencing other believers. Uh, Romans 14, 13, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. We're influencing other people. We're helping other people. It's very, very important. Enoch knew this, and he began his walk with God, obviously a tremendous walk with God, and we see here the influence that had on his family down the line, didn't it? And later would come that man by the name of Noah. Thank God Noah had a good heritage. He had a good family. He had all of that. And he knew it. And he stayed true in the midst of a wicked, the Bible says, and perverse nation or generation. Uh, secondly, a good testimony is very fragile. It's very fragile. It's our most valuable possession. As you think about it, we keep that, we hold it, but it can be perishable. Our salvation is the most valuable thing we possess. We know that. Thank the Lord for that. But we cannot lose our salvation. But we can lose, you know, in a few careless moments, what you've worked for 
for years and decades to build. It only takes one foolish act, one thankful, a hateful thing, as you think. Very carefully. We think about David. I mentioned on Sunday, David again. David was, he had a near perfect record, didn't he? Perfect record. Not once do we read in Scripture that he was disobedient. Not once do we read that he was un, ungodly. He used foul language. He, didn't, he wasn't a promiscuous. None of that. Until that one incident, wasn't it? One thing, and he ruined it. One little issue. And it's brought up repeatedly, as you know, in the Old Testament several times. And the Lord himself says on at least two occasions, he says, except in the matter of dot, 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 right? David was good. He was right. He's a man of my own heart, except in the matter of. Now, a good testimony is very fragile. Uh, we think about by abstaining from fleshly lusts, obviously, we keep our testimony. 1 Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. The soul. Being very careful about that. Your soul, as I said again, Sunday needs to be happy. That's your emotions, intellect, and will. It's the control center of your heart, of your body. We have that which is physical, the body, but the soul. That's who we are. Personality, all of that. We're to guard our soul. It's a proverb says, keep our hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, right? Be cautious and careful about that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from it and be careful. Uh, careful guarding our, uh, not only our lives, but our tongues, our the way we affect, we con the Bible uses the word conversation. We interact with other people. We know that. So we cautious and careful. Enoch said, I'd rather please God than please man and please those around me. As Paul later says, be latter days there will be those that come are men pleasers. Men pleasers. But notice then thirdly here, a good testimony is that he pleased God. That's what I want to hit on here. Enoch, he had a pleasure in pleasing God. He wanted to do that. It was very simple. Now, as we think a moment about our testimony, we desire certain things in life. We like things a certain way. We're looking for fulfillment, satisfaction, and all of that, security and peace. Basically, there are two courses we can take to achieve this. One is the course of the world, which involves pleasing people to get what I want. The other is pleasing God. In this world, you can't get anything without pleasing people. I mean, you have to please this guy in order to get him to come and do your electrical work. And you've got to please this person at work so that you can keep your job. You have to do it. But you think about it, we have to put God on top and please Him. Prioritize God in your life. You know that. Usually, these diametrically oppose each other. Do you please the world or please God? Now, we've got to ask ourselves some certain questions. Am I pleasing God? Now, a couple of things here. How successful am I? I want to be successful. I would be more successful if I, and you fill in the blank, if I what? Worked harder? Invested more money? Did the, No. Or is it something spiritual? I'd be more successful if I spent more time with my children in the Word of God. I'd be more successful if I what? You fill it in. Coming back to what is your testimony? What are you seeking? Are you pleasing God? How significant are you? Is a challenge for many people. Am I significant? I would be more significant if I, what, dropped your standards, obviously. Uh, we'd be more significant in this world if I did this or that. Or spiritual. Or if I, what, pleased God, put aside those things that are insignificant, according to the Bible. How fulfilled am I? I'd be more fulfilled if I, what, again, coming back, am I satisfied? Am I happy? I'd be happier if I, I, I I'd be more secure if I, I'd be more peaceful if I, whatever the case is, he says here. Now, note in our text as we continue, verse 6, but without faith, it is somewhat possible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them, him, them that diligently seek him. No, what's it say? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. You ought to look up the word impossible in your Bible. Impossible. It cannot be done without faith. You can't please Him without faith. You think about the generation Enoch lived in, and the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details in that, but you think about it. It was not a good generation leading up to that, obviously. We know that. God looked down and said, right at Noah's generation, this is the, I, it grieves me. He repents of that. says, I should not have created man, and all that went with that. This must have been a horrific time. 
And Enoch followed God by faith. It wasn't by sight. It was by faith. I'm going to please him. I'm going to please him anyways. And you and I ought to determine that. I'm going to please God anyways. Although it hurts, although it's painful, although I don't want to, although I'm tired, although blah, blah, blah. I'm going to please God anyways. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to be part of that. Why? Because it doesn't please God. Your response to the, I would be more. It helps determine the course you're following, pleasing the world, pleasing God. Does God want us to have things in our lives? Absolutely, yes. That's clear today. We're blessed beyond measure. Beyond measure. There's children, six, seven, eight children in one home, live in a one-bedroom house somewhere. You know, all over the place, all over our city. Albuquerque especially, you know that. And we enjoy so much, don't we? I mean, just so much. And last time you said thank you, let me point to myself. How, when's the last time I said thank you? Last time I said, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for letting me wake up today and give me. The problem is to have a sour spirit and a bad testimony is because we're ungrateful. And that's so true. Does God want us to have good things? Absolutely. In order to truly have them, we must choose our course of pleasing Him. Allow Him to provide them in His time, in His way, instead of looking to people and to pleasing them. Jesus Christ, we know, is the most successful man and has the best testimony of any man to ever enter this life or this world. He summed it up this way in John 8, verse 29, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. The most successful man to ever walk the face of the earth, Jesus Christ. Nothing failed with him. Nothing. Not one word, nothing. And we know that. And he says, I always do those things that please him. So we know when we please the Father, when we please God, we'll have the right testimony. We'll have what we need. God is not hard to please. People are hard to please, but not God. What does God want from us? We know he wants our love. He wants our fellowship. He wants our friendship. He wants us to talk with him, fellowship with him. Uh, you can imagine with me, if you will, Enoch is just walking along one day. I don't know what the situation was. Maybe just walking along with talking to the Lord, talking out loud. And by the way, it's okay to talk to yourself out loud. Anyone else do that? Nobody else? Okay. <laughs> and you talk to yourself out loud, you're walking along. I couldn't imagine. Enoch said, you know, Lord, thank you for this. I'm so grateful to you. And I pray you bless my grandchildren. Please be with my children and my sons and daughters. Help us. And all of a sudden he's translated up. Great picture for us of the rapture, you know. But as we think about, Enoch truly desired his testimony. What's your testimony today? Is it where it should be? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's impossible. Verse number 7, note, by faith then Noah. Noah, being warned of God of the things not seen yet, moved with fear. Where did he get that fear from? I guarantee it's from some part of Enoch. He moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, became the heir, notice, of righteousness, which is by faith, by faith. So we see here, you have a tremendous impact upon the people around you, especially upon your children, on your grandchildren, upon those people directly in your circle of influence, directly. Your testimony is where it should be. I can recall several times, but I was not paying attention one day, and I was driving around, and I guy was riding me and I tried to get over. He got behind me. You know, one of those things. And I was just frustrated. And I'm like, what is this guy's problem? And he's doing all kinds of gestures at me, you know. And I was, <laughs> so I'm going, I don't know what's going on. And it hit me right in that moment. Testimony. You te testimony. You know? You're driving and you're going, oh, okay. Testimony, testimony. And it can be ruined. And I wish, it bought, do you ever wish you could talk to those people, you know, without getting punched in the face? You know? <laughs> I just want to talk to you for a minute. But you can't. But you think about a testimony, and if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to help you, guide you, again, coming back to, am I pleasing self, man, or God? He will. He'll help you. It's God is not hard to please. We said that when we walk with Him, we find that the fleshly lusts are much easier to defeat. We find it much easier to guard our tongues, to abstain from even the appearance of evil. And we develop that good testimony that's pleasing to God is there a hard side to pleasing God and having a good testimony? Absolutely. The hard side is that when we please God, there will be some people, sometimes very important people, that will not be pleased with us. And it's hard for every human being to have somebody that doesn't like you or you're not, they're not pleased with you. They're not pleased. And it bothers you. There's a hard, hard part of it about pleasing God. 
We give Him first place in our lives. We give Jesus Christ the preeminence in all things of people around us who are not doing His will. They will turn away from God, and that's their choice. But we continue to please God. We keep going. If I want to be used of God to help those who refuse to give Him rightful place in their lives, I must have a good testimony that I'm pleasing God. You think about that. In our society today, and I'll wrap it up here, we cannot really, in a lot of ways, go up to people and just give them a gospel track or tell them, hey, if you died today, do you know where you'd go? It's, it's difficult today. Back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of it you could because it just has changed in that way. People are so entertainment-minded, social media-minded. You think about it. Now, it still works, and I encourage you to do that, absolutely, but think about that. We not necessarily can bring a Bible to your coworkers tomorrow and show them Scripture for Scripture. You could. You may get fired. I don't know. But what we can do is have a good testimony. We say, they see you walk by. They hear you what you do. They see what you post online. They go, there's something about that person. They look like Jesus. They sound like Jesus. They, they, they are like Jesus Christ. That's who a Christian should be. I think that's what a Christian should be. And I think there's far more people reached with the gospel by a good testimony. Sometimes people work their entire lives to share the gospel with people, reaching them with a gospel track or whatever, and don't have a lot of success. But there's a lot of people that have a good testimony. They may not be good. They're introverted. They're not good at that. But they have a good testimony and they reach people for Christ. Do you have one tonight? I believe you do. I pray and encourage you to keep that testimony. How do you do that? Well, tomorrow you need to wake up and say, God, I want to please you. I want to know what you want me to do. Please you. Kids, you ought to please. Tomorrow, ask God, Lord, I want to please you. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Please you. Uh, we know that and think about it. Pleasing. He had this testimony that he pleased God. And so we'll think about this a little bit more next week. Hopefully as we continue that a disciple is not only living the crucified life, not only is truly sold out to Christ, he's a cut above the average Christian today, but he has a, especially a good testimony. And people saw Enoch walking and said, he's got a testimony, doesn't he? <laughs> he knows where he's going. And people today are looking for somebody that knows where they're going. You're looking for a mother today they can look to as an example. Ladies out there all over the place today, they have three, four, five kids, don't know what to do. They look to you, maybe. They look to someone. A father out there that's derelict. They're looking for some kind of leadership. And we need men and women tonight, we know, to be led of God in the Scriptures, having a good, faithful testimony. What a wonderful, wonderful story we see here. Now, uh, we'll look at it a little bit next week, as I said. Looking through. What else does a disciple is required of a disciple? The master of the disciple is not hard to please. He says, I will show you the way if you'll follow me. And again, he doesn't want to take us and break us down and leave us down and say, well, you're my servant. You do whatever I say. No, that's not our God. He desires to use us in a mighty way, much mightier than we could do on our own, right? Much mightier. And that's the God we serve. Do you have a good testimony tonight? I hope you do. And uh, praying for you. Hope you stay in your Bibles this week. Stay in your prayer closet. And let God lead you and guide you in your life this week to have a good testimony. You can't do it on your own. It's only God, right? Amen? All right. Amen. Lord, thank you again for an opportunity tonight. These faithful people, Lord, we could have just stayed home tonight, Lord. And Father, we, I know everyone in here has a thousand different things they could have done, especially, Lord, they've worked hard all day. They got up very early before the sun rose, and they've worked very hard, and they're tired. But, Lord, they took time tonight to come out to this little church and hear from the Word. And I pray, Father, that you'd bless us all as we think about, Lord, that we could blow a testimony in just a few seconds. We could ruin it. We could turn somebody away from the gospel. We could turn somebody away from following you that may have been right on the edge there, right on the precipice, Lord, and we turn them away by something we say, by some kind of attitude we have, by some kind of spirit we may give them. Lord, strengthen us. We're not perfect. We cannot be sinless. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have bad days, Lord. But Lord, we know that if we're walking with you and we're pleasing you, and that's our goal, Father, you'll help us. You'll guide us. You'll give us all that we need, Lord. And we would like and desire to be just like Enoch, Lord. We pray for that good testimony. Strengthen us this week as these dear folks have to deal with people in the world. I pray you'd empower them. Be with our children, our mothers, fathers, grandparents, all across the board. Again, Lord, put your hand and hedge about them. In Jesus' precious name, Again, we pray, Amen.